Shalom Chavri, I'm Stephen Vernon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Many of you already no doubt watching live broadcasts of President Trump inside of Israel. He is, of course, left Riyadh earlier this morning, landing in Israel a couple of hours ago now. This, I wanted to share with you, though, an opening statement that he makes at the uh, Ben Gurion Airport in Israel, Tel Aviv. Uh, I think that his, his comments are very nice, Pre appreciate tremendously President Trump's stand for Israel, but there's just little things that you'll see here that kind of can't help but trouble you just a bit here. And we're going to go into some biblical uh, aspects of this in just a moment as well. Israel. Listen to this. We respect Israel, and I send your people the warmest greetings from your friend and ally, all of the people in the United States of America. We are with you. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. And absolutely, we know that the people of America do stand with uh, Israel. Many of them do. I know there's, of course, not everybody does, but uh, there's many of the people always stand with Israel, especially amongst the Christian community uh, and Jewish community standing with Israel. Uh, but this is what really kind of troubled me. As soon as he finishes speaking, uh, the camera backs out. Of course, you see the, uh, the, the president's uh, uh, plane, the Boeing 747 there, and the red carpet from the stairway all the way here to a pyramid-shaped uh, place. The people sitting at the, at the bottom of the pyramid, the Israelis sitting at the bottom, and of course the president at the top of the, not quite at the top of the pyramid, mind you. I'm sure if the Pope was there, he'd probably be at the top of the pyramid. Uh, but it's just an eerie feeling to see this. Now, just to share something with you, though, uh, and I remember when Paul Bagley, I think I was in Israel at the same time he did this, he had actually filmed himself uh, the, the courthouse there, the Supreme Court of Israel, that was built by the Rothschilds, no less, with the pyramid on top of the building here. As you can see, I got the mouse cursor right there, and there's an all-seeing eye right inside of that. I don't know which uh, video Paul has on this on his uh, YouTube channel there where he shows the inside, but he actually goes in the Supreme Court building as well. Him and uh, Heidi Bagley both go in there and do some more filming of some very strange things. Uh, so definitely there's a lot of Freemasonry, Illuminati in behind the things that are going on uh, inside of Israel. Uh, not the Jewish people, and it's not anything to do with true Judaism uh, and those that are looking for the coming of the Mashiach, the coming of the Messiah, but there is definitely a very wicked, sinister plot in behind there. So that really kind of troubled me to see that President Trump was right there in the midst of this, uh, just really troubling. Now, just real quick, I'll show you, see if we got any live footage as of yet. They, they are filming live there in Israel as President Trump has been moving around. Ar uh, Arsen uh, Ostro Strovansky, uh, has been sharing a lot of this. He is a journalist there uh, in Israel, and he's been, uh, actually, I don't know if, yeah, I think he is a journalist in Israel. Maybe he's from uh, uh, Italy. I'm not really sure, but anyway, so they don't have the live broadcast as of, as of right now. Moving on, though, let's move on to some other things that are going on. I want to also share a little clip here with President Trump, with uh, President Rivlin. This is at the uh, Israeli embassy. Uh, and I'd like for you to hear something that President Trump has to say here to President Rivlin, and then we're going to get into some biblical prophecies, I think, of things that are unraveling, unfolding as we speak here that are going to really, uh, no doubt, shake you to the core. Listen to what President Trump has to say here as well. What's happened with Iran has brought many other parts of the Middle East toward Israel. And you could say that's one of the, if it is a benefit, that would be the benefit, because I've seen such, uh, such a different feeling toward this. And he's talking about a lot of buffering on this. As you know, we're not feeling... He's, he's speaking about Iran so being the cause of bringing other countries in the Middle East together with Israel. And it seems like uh, President Rivlin isn't as for this uh, idea. You've seen it and you've even mentioned it many, on many occasions. So uh, that is a real positive. And we're very happy about that. Every challenge creates opportunity. It's a challenge and it's an opportunity. You know, if you have a great opportunity right now, there's a great feeling for peace throughout the Middle East. I think people have just had enough. 
All right, so here's the issue right here. President Trump is saying there's a great opportunity for peace throughout the Middle East. Uh, he is speaking about Saudi Arabia being one of those so-called partners there. And Israel is willing to work with Saudi Arabia under one condition, and that's to bring down Iran. And of course, Iran is in Syria. So if we get uh, launch an attack, if the United States and their NATO allies launch an attack on Damascus, Syria, they know that this will draw Iran into the conflict, and this is what will give them the opportunity to take down Iran at that time. Uh, and so therefore, they're willing to work with them. And I think this has a lot to do with why President Trump signed such a massive military deal there uh, with the Saudis, uh, the first one, $109 billion and a committal uh, of, uh, from 55 Arabic nations, a committal to bring in uh, 34,000 troops into the battle here that they're about to get ready to engage, and that's going to be first, taking down uh, Damascus, removing President Bashar al-Assad from power. They're doing that also to try to draw Iran into the fight because Iran has vowed with Russia in order to protect Bashar al-Assad. But you see, Russia may not protect Bashar al-Assad. In fact, the United States has made an offer for uh, Russia to remove Assad and get him and his family to safety inside of Russia and avoid facing any kind of prosecution. In exchange, Russia would get Crimea and, and be able to annex eastern Ukraine without any problems from NATO. Now, whether or not Russia will accept this deal or not, I don't know. It's a grave concern to me to see that Russia would not stand there and support uh, President Bashar al-Assad and the people of Syria because once something like this happens, then this is going to leave a huge vacuum and a lot of innocent Syrians will die, especially that of the Christian Syrians. And we've already shared with you our opinions on Isaiah 17, the fall of Damascus, it becomes a ruinous heap, but also the fortress of Ephraim. That is the house of Israel that had became believers in Yeshua 2,000 years ago and who have always had a safe haven under the leaders of Syria down through the years here and especially in modern times when Damascus falls, the fortress of Ephraim also will fall with it. So therefore, uh, the biblical prophecy in Isaiah 17 clearly showing that the Christians of Syria will be massacred as a result uh, or at least to the, to the point of they will have no safe haven because why? Uh, now the Free Syrian Army, al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, all of those that are opposed to them will definitely uh, remove them from being there and they will have to go into to hiding, no doubt about it. Uh, I'd like you to see real quick too, Murad Gazdiev, he does a, a report here uh, about President Trump's meeting there in uh, Saudi Arabia and as he brings it out in here, it's an about face, a 180 turnaround from what Trump was saying in the campaign as to what he was saying when he actually got there to, um, uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia and met with the Saudi princes there. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, we have a, 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 a friendly relationship with Murad Gazdiev, uh, who is a, a, uh, RT's very own reporter, field reporter, as well as studio reporter. Listen to this one here. Donald Trump has addressed leaders of more than 50 Muslim-majority countries gathered in Saudi Arabia about tackling extremism. Listening in was our correspondent, Murad Gazdiev. It's a total turnaround, 180 degree about face. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, Trump the presidential candidate and Trump the president might as well be two different people. Our goal is a coalition of nations who share the aim of stamping out extremism and providing our children a hopeful future. It's going to be very, very profound having to do with Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia's role on the World Trade Center and the attack. You know, it's sort of nice to know who your friends are and perhaps who your enemies are. And he got a royal welcome. No expenses spared. The red carpet, golden necklaces, and even a little dancing. Look, Trump is a businessman. What? motivates such people. It's money, it's profit, it's deals. And conflict is bad for business, but selling guns, that's good. Yesterday we signed historic agreements with the king. 
They did sign a historic agreement worth $350 billion over 10 years and $109 billion the very first year. It's a good boost for the U.S. economy. It is certainly will put many Americans back to work. But the question is, is the price, is the money well worth uh, supplying weapons to a state that has been very well known for arming those groups that are toppling democratic governments uh, throughout the Middle East? can't say so much for Iraq being a democratic government, but when it comes to Syria, they do have the right to vote who they want for their president. And as we have heard from our own listeners out of Syria who have all stated they stand with Bashar al-Assad, they had a right to tell us they hate the guy. They had a right to tell us that he's not good for the country. But we are hearing from those believers in Yeshua, those believers in Jesus from Syria, writing us personally and telling us that they stand for Bashar al-Assad. And they said if he's removed from power, it'll be dangerous for them. So we do understand that. Murad Gazdiev, two thumbs up for this man here. He, he does an excellent job. He's done a lot of reporting out of Syria. He's really helped us out here a lot on Israeli News Live on finding out and knowing things that are going on uh, and giving us inside uh, help and sh sharing with you here on Israeli News Live those facts that are happening on the ground inside of Syria. Now let's jump over to the biblical prophecy aspect of this. Of course, it's obvious as far as Daniel 11, what we're looking at, we're already seeing uh, something that uh, I've shared with you already about uh, the, the coming into the lands there, it being in a plural form, the Eratzot, Baratzot, in verse 40 there, uh, and he and shall overflow as he passes through. Now, this is not speaking of President Trump, and this is something I really want people to understand. I'm not against President Trump. The king of the north is not President Trump. President Trump is only one of the horses uh, that the, the Roman Empire is riding. Uh, there's many other uh, horses as well that he rides, uh, and, and I'm not talking about the four horses of Revelation either, but what I'm speaking about is those powers, the beast of powers that he is riding to carry out these battles that are going on in the Middle East. And all you have to do is look at biblical history. It's always been, uh, the, the king of the north has always been either, either uh, the Babylonian king or it was the Greek, uh, Greco-Roman kings that were considered to be the kings of the north. Not Russia, and in fact it can't be Russia because now even scholars agree that the tidings out of the east and out of the north that trouble him, the him being the king of the north, is Russia and China. So how could Russia play both parts? How could Russia trouble himself and then have to deal with it as well? It doesn't make sense. It is, it's just totally, completely different. All right, so anyway, the point is though is there's a lot of prophecy when it comes to Daniel uh, chapter uh, 11 here that it fulfills over a period of time. Like for example, verse 39, when he shall deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for a price. This was back at the advent of World War I. They did divide the land for a price after destroying the Ottoman Empire with the help of that foreign god, by the way, which was none other than Rome uh, uniting with the British Empire and overthrowing these lands. We ended up with a French mandate, a British mandate, the dividing of Israel several times over. So it wasn't just the land of Israel, it was also the lands all in that area. All right, but then it says, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push in him, and the king of the north shall uh, come against him like a whirlwind in chariots and with horsemen. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow as he passes through. Then we've seen the overthrow of all these different nations all around Israel, uh, including Iraq, Syria now, uh, Libya, um, <laughs> Egypt, you name it, they're all through this Middle East area. They have come down, these nations here. And of course, it's with the NATO force that this is being done with. Then he goes on down and it says, He shall enter into the beautiful land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Chief of the children of Ammon is the Jordanians, and of course, Moab happens to be the Palestinian people. And don't forget, President Trump, as he was coming in on this tour there, besides going into Saudi Arabia, according to his own White House uh, uh, press release there where it was showing where he would be flying to when it showed Israel the Golan was removed from the map. I shared that with you the other day. The Golan, according to some information that we had gotten a little while back and had already released it here on Israeli News Live, is supposed to be part of a two-state land swap deal that will be given to the Palestinians. Not to the Syrians, but to the Palestinians. You've got to remember, they're going to take down Syria. So that's a whole different idea altogether. So Israel is missing the Golan Heights. 
But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Uh, there again, we see the Ethiopians and the Libyans. We see Libya fail. We see the Ethiopians right now in a turmoil. Because why? The, the mineral-rich area as it is. The, he has power over the treasures of gold and, and silver. That's another interesting thing. Of Egypt, no less. Well, those secrets of what they can do with gold and silver is something that they have been hoarding and not allowing to ever go out to the public. I could tell you some things about that, but we'll just kind of leave that at its own place. Now we'll come up to the part about the tidings out of the east. Now the north shall affrighten him, and he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly take away many. In the King James it says, make away many, which like many people should be take away. It doesn't make sense to say make away, but anyway, it's nonetheless, doesn't really matter. The point is, it seems that North Korea could be the catalyst for that because uh, it's not just the fact that Russia and even China uh, came to the aid of Syria, but more so Russia than China. You have to see us the other way around. Russia came in first with Syria, and then China uh, seemed to kind of help out as well. But in the case of North Korea, it's China first, then Russia. That seems to fit the biblical narrative a little bit more. So I think that'll be a catalyst that'll really cause uh, NATO powers to try to, to go in there and will try to make or take away many. We'll really try to kill a lot of people in the process of this. Uh, and of course, this is where he follows up with setting up the tents in the palace between the seas and the beautiful Mount Holy Mountain, and he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Now this is, again, it has nothing to do with the President of the United States. You're talking about the Roman king over there that sits there, right there in Rome, Italy. All right, now, moving on though, let's look at Micah. Micah is another interesting prophecy, and I want to share some things with you in Micah chapter 7 that may be something that you haven't noticed before. Woe is me, for I am at last the summer fruits is the great gleaning of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat, and, the, and, and nor first ripe fig, which my soul desire. The goodly man is perished out of the earth, and the upright among men is no more. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. Is that not what we have today? I mean, all the good men are gone. Where's anybody who's really trying to bring peace? They figure being in peace is just kill off more of them. There's a biblical prophecy that says they would annihilate entire races. Yes. Their hands are upon that which is evil to do it diligently. The prince asketh of the judge is ready for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them, the best of them is a briar. And the most upright is worse than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman, even thy visitation is come. Now shall be their perplexity. So it doesn't matter how good the leaders are. The best of them is worse than a thorn hedge. Trust ye not in a friend, put you not confidence in a familiar friend. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. You know how many people mess that scripture up thinking, Oh my gosh, these women, they're the worst things on planet earth. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with Rome and Israel. See, what does he say? Keep the door of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. And unfortunately, Israel has already opened up the door and now is letting Rome, who is considered to be that, supposed to be the bride of Christ. She's supposed to be the woman. The, she's supposed to be a bride. But see, she lies in the bosom of Israel. And God says, do not trust her. All right? Keep thy door in thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son, watch this, for the son dishonoreth the father. Mm -hmm. See, Rome totally dishonored God's word. Now watch what it says. The daughter rises up, up against her mother. That's the daughters of Rome. Remember in Revelation it speaks about the, that the great whore had daughters? Yeah, there you go. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Well, oh, Brother Steve, where are you going to come up with a good type for that? It's very easy. What did Rome create? Rome created the Islamic faith, the Muslim religion. They were the ones that brought in Muhammad the prophet. They were the ones that the, in northern Africa that the Jesuits groomed him and sent out word to all the Arabs in the, in the region there that there was rising up a great prophet among him. And of course, Muhammad was that prophet. So they kind of married Muhammad in, but not as a Christian. So what is he there? He's a son-in-law. 
Well, son-in-laws get married and they have daughter-in-law. So now what do we have? The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. In other words, Islam will rise up against her as well. Although it is, they are they're related by marriage, but still not faithful. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Though I am fallen, I shall arise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord is a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me, he will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. Then my enemy shall see it and shame shall cover, who, cover her, Rome, who said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eye shall gaze upon her. Now she shall be trodden as the mire of the streets. But it doesn't happen right yet. It's coming, but not yet. The day for building thy walls, even that day, shall be far removed. Hmm. Walling up, putting Israel in a box, huh? There shall be a day when they shall come unto you from Assyria, even to the cities of Egypt. Actually, it should be from the cities of Egypt, all right? Because watch, what it, watch the way it is in Hebrew. Lamane, uh, Lamane, Asur, Ve'ari, Matsur. Okay, that, uh, there you have Egypt, you have Syria, but you, when you don't, when you go, and the city uh, of Egypt, all right? So, but once you start out in the sentence, Lamane, then it's from, okay? So it's from Assyria and from the cities of, uh, of Egypt, okay? Now, anyway, and from uh, Egypt even to the river and from the sea to sea and from mountain to mountain, and the land shall be desolate for them that dwell therein because the fruit of their doings. Whose doings? Rome's military. Rome's military went in there and created a desolation amongst all these nations here. And that's what's caused it. Is that not what we've seen? Is that not NATO's army? Is that not Rome's military, the king of the north? His military has basically utterly made the lands desolate. All of Assyria, what is considered to be modern day Syria, which would be all of Syria and that of northwest Iraq, they have just totally pummeled these places to oblivion. Then what does it say here? Very interesting. The next prophecy here, verse 14. Tend thy people with thy staff, the flock of thy heritage, that dwell solitarily as a forest in the midst of the fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. Now, by the way, this here, this is not a mate. Mate is what Moses carried in his hand here. But it does speak about ro'e amcha. That is like shepherding your people. Ro'e amcha. Beshabetecha, that kind of staff, that kind of rod is something that is within the human body. That I believe that rod is a DNA strand. It is what Moses and Elijah come back with. Why do you think Moses comes in the first place? Moses comes because of the children of Israel that do not seem to know the law. All right? They seem to have forgotten the commandments of God, and so therefore God sends Moshe to the Jewish people to get them in line with what the Word of God actually says. Well, some might say, well, what about Elijah then? Elijah doesn't know. I mean, Elijah was just the prophet in the days of old. No, sir, not so. Let me tell you something. Elijah stood there and heard the words of Yeshua as he preached those words, and he was there when he baptized him in the Jordan River. That's why Eliyahu who the prophet, even Yeshua himself said, when, when John was already dead, they asked Jesus the question, why does the scripture say that Elias must first come and, and, and restore all things? And Yeshua said, he's already come. They did to him whatever they was listed. But then he said, but he shall come and restore all things. What are you talking about? Restore all things. He's going to restore back the very message that Jesus Christ brought to the children of Israel when he first come because he was there. He was there in the man called John the Baptist. In fact, the Bible said they understood that he spoke of John the Baptist when he said these things. 
All right, so Elijah's coming back again. He's in a human body. He's here today. He knows what Jesus preached back then. The only thing is, is it's not been revealed as of yet to neither one of these men that are anointed with their spirits. That are, that, 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 notice, because that's what it is. The rod, which is an ancestral rod. All right, in other words, you can come into the, when you are born into this world, you come as you're born in your own DNA you have memory of your own ancestry encoded in your DNA. Perhaps that's why you like certain things and don't know why you like certain things. Perhaps that's why you have certain fears. Don't know why you have those certain fears. You're afraid of heights. You're afraid of airplanes. Maybe something happened in your ancestor's life. It's the same thing with cancers and things like that. What does a doctor ask you? Do you have cancer in your family? Why? Because genetically it passes down as well as does the memories. As we know from documented evidence of heart surgeons and with heart transplants, the patient that receives the new heart can pick up the memories of the other person that had the heart. In fact, one murder case was resolved over a girl that was murdered by the recipient that got her heart. All right. So now we go back. We can look, for example, at a book called The Apocryphon of Moses. And this is where Moses tells Joshua, he says, take these books that I have written and hide them in an earthen vessel. And when Moses told Joshua to hide those books in an earthen vessel that he had written is because Moses was concerned about his writings coming down and people perverting what he said. So what did he do? He put them in the earthen vessel. It wasn't a glass jar. He is that earthen vessel. And so what did, what did Joshua do? He read those books. He put them within his own DNA encoded inside of himself. So it'd be passed on from generation to generation to generation to generation. And now in this day, Moses and Elijah will soon walk on the earth. Both of them serving a purpose. Moses for the children of Israel to tell them what the law really meant. What it was. What it was. Why it was given. You know, think about it. Yeshua, when he came, he challenged part of the Levitical law. One of the main ones that everybody knows about was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He says, you have heard it said of them of all time, an eye for an eye and a, you know, he said, but I said unto you, if they sue you at the law, give them your coat. If they want your coat, give them your cloak also. Just paraphrasing that. But where is he quoting from? Levitical law. Moses says, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, limb for limb. Right? I think it's around Leviticus chapter 20 or 22. All right, come on. This is why they come like that. And that's why Elijah comes. Because a lot of things that people don't know is that Elijah was there as John the Baptist. So he heard the message of Jesus Christ. Amazing, isn't it? So as in the days, and here's the other thing. Let them feed in Bashan and in Gilead as in the days of old. You know what Bashan and Gilead is? This is where the giants were. The Nephilim is actually a different group. It wasn't, the, they were still called the Nephilim, but in Bashan and Gilead is where the giants were. And watch what he says. As in the days of thy coming forth out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things, wonderful things. Nephilot, Nephilot, guys, guys is, is miracles that you could just not even imagine that they will do. Great exploits. You're talking about beating down some giants in this day. They're the ones that can do it. The nation shall see them put to shame for all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like the serpent, like crawling things out of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their close places. They shall come where, with fear unto the Lord our God and shall be afraid because of you. Who is God? What things are going to come out? Those giants. Think about it. We're in a glorious time. And what's going on right now in the Middle East is only, a, is only setting the stage. It's coming, friends. We're at the door. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Don't forget, if these type messages are a blessing to you, stand up and support the work we're doing. We definitely do need your help or your help is desperately needed. You can do that by going to IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can donate there. If you're on Israeli News Live, the, our YouTube channel, just make sure you're on Israeli News Live. There is a donut button right above the subscribe button. You can donate there. If you're watching this on Danoon Institute, 
just check it out on israelinewslive.org.